do what we know we're going to talk about patents and trademarks for startups. So, let's get right into it. So, this is basically a quick overview of today's presentation. Um, um, we're going to do a quick overview. I'm going to talk a little bit about trademarks. And uh, after we talk about trademarks, the bulk of the presentation, we're going to talk about patents. So, uh, what is a patent? How do you file a patent? How do you do the filing? And then what happens with the patent office? Um, and uh, there's actually a question about the domain name. So, if it's time to hand, I'm happy to take questions and talk about the domain name. Um, and I'm fine with taking questions during the presentation. Just um, try to keep them like on the slide and then. Um, at the end, you know, I'll take any general questions, any questions on other issues, or a couple people in the afterwards. Um, so, this is me, this is what I do. I'm patentlawnj.com. That's because I'm in New Jersey. When I'm in New York, I say I'm patentlawny.com. I do work very well. I do work anywhere. My furthest client so far is Hong Kong. I think Afghanistan isn't quite as far. He's in the army, so. Um, so I should have in Pakistan, too. Um, but anyway, patents are the United States. They, I do U.S. patents. I also do filings around the world. Um, I handle all aspects of patents, trademarks, copyrights, domain disputes. Previous lifetime, I used to do web pages. Um, I run Linux, so I had trouble getting the thing started this morning because you can do more, but invariably, more stuff can go wrong. Um, and some of my work, just to give you some background of what I do, I'm actually going to talk about this one a bit today. Uh, used phones bid at an auction. That's patent number 7783526. I got that patent. These are ones that I thought would be most relevant to you know, NJ Tech Meetup. Um, change the amplitude as, as you bend the endoscope. I got, I got that patent too. That's patent 7942809. And one of my more recent ones is patent 8048231. We've now crossed it to 8 million patents. This one issued a couple months ago for cavitation sonic wave cleaners. So this is the type I think the thing I do. You have a new concept, whether it be like an iPhone app or medical devices, that one was, or consumer device. Those are all different types of things that you can patent. So, still we're in the intro section. These are the different types of intellectual property. We've got patents, trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets. So, a patent is any new and useful process machine, manufacturer, composition of matter, or any new useful improvement thereof. 35 USC 101 basis of patent law. So, patent is basically what we consider an invention. Today, sometimes we don't consider these things inventions so much, but we might say new technology. You know, whatever the new technology is, whether it be a new method of auctioning using your cell phone data plan, or it's a new type of light bulb, to use the classic example, or whatever it is. Trademarks, it identifies products or services consumers with which the trademark appears to originate from a unique source. I pulled that one from Wikipedia. It's not quite as authoritative, but uh, it, uh, I thought it was a good definition. In other words, it's anything that identifies a source. If you have uh, M&Ms written on your candy, that identifies a source. I know it's coming from a certain company uh, in wherever they are in Pennsylvania, I believe, and I know I'm going to get the same candy from them. Someone else can't go and call the products m and because I don't know if it's the same quality. I don't know if the advertising dollars that we bring into it are going to that name. Um, just briefly, domains can come under trademarks. It depends what you sell. So if you have a domain for m and well, their trademark is probably so broad that they're going to be able to get that domain from you in a dispute. But on the other hand, if you have, say, Mission 50, and there's a mission50.com, which is registered to another organization somewhere, they're allowed to do that. Now, it depends what happens. If you've trademarked Mission 50, they're not going to be able to use on their website things related to it. If you have a trademark for Mission 50 that covers goods such as uh, entrepreneurial services, startup services, incub business incubator, that type of thing. They're not going to be able to use mission50.com for that because that is confusingly similar. But if they're using mission50 as, say, I don't know, first thing that comes to mind, be a missionary, then that's not confusingly similar. So because they're using for different types of goods. So in a domain dispute, it has to be, uh, it has to be um, infringing upon a trademark first and foremost. They have to have no valid business reason to do it and uh, they have to be doing it in bad faith. Basically, the only type of thing you can make from someone is if they're purposely ripping you off. 
WIPA, World Intellectual Property Organization, I mean, my opinion is they didn't want to deal with it. They didn't want to be lawyers. The, 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 whole, the whole purpose of domain disputes, and this is the only time I'm going to talk about it unless you ask me questions at the end. The whole purpose of domain name disputes is just they wanted to clear out names that shouldn't have been registered. Like when everyone was registering .coms, if you register abcnews.com, you're not ABC News, they wanted a quick and simple way to go give it to ABC and not have to take every one of those course case to, cases to court. But for the most part, domain name disputes are not the easiest thing in the world. It has to be all those three things I mentioned. It has to be trademark infringement, they have to have no legitimate business purpose, and they have to have been registered. All right, copyrights, works of authorship, and use of tangible use of expression. So copyrights, again, I'm going to talk about it quickly here. It's not really a focus of today's presentation, but it is important to know the difference. Copyrights refer to things which are artistic. The guy who designed this, he can actually get a design patent on this, which, but uh, the copyright as an artistic work, he could copyright this light over here, or any of these lights over here that you can see. Um, and, uh, it's interesting where where the and trade secrets secrets protected with legal rights can reverse engineer. So trade secrets are basically you don't file it because you keep it to yourself and you don't let anyone know. And but someone can go and reverse engineer and copy it. Now that's allowed. This is most famously this is done. Compact copy the IBM computer. They had two teams. They had one team that was reverse engineering the, the BIOS, the basic input and output system on the IBM personal computer, and they had another team programming it. So they couldn't be accused of breaking copyrights because they said, well, this team reverse engineered that was allowed. This team just looked at their what they gave them, what team one gave team two when they did it. So where this overlaps, and actually a very interesting case, I was actually just interviewed for the New York Times blog on this. Um, uh, is anyone familiar with, uh, was it, uh, Bikram Yoga. Mm -hmm. So Bikram Yoga is involved in the lawsuit now, as they tend to be, because they protect their, their copyright vigorously. They have actually, for those that don't know, because I didn't know until they told me they wanted to interview me, I looked it up. Bikram Yoga is a series of, I believe it's 26 moves. Did I get that right? It's not my area of expertise now. I'm getting out of my, my area here. I think it's 26 successive moves of positions that you do in like 100 degree heat, 90% humidity, and this, he says, there's all sorts of medical implications and properties and helps you, and it's, it's, it's hot. This guy is, you know, he's, uh, he's licensing these things all over the world. To become a licensed instructor costs $10,000, and then even then you need his approval to open, you open a uh, Bikram Yoga place. So how does he do this? He's doing this through copyrights. He's actually protected his series of moves. Now there's another one, Yoga for the People. Yoga for the people, not a trademark problem, because yoga is descriptive. I can't, if I call it yoga, I can't protect that name. It's yoga, that's what it is. That's, that's a word out there for anyone to use. So what he's, he's done, he's called it yoga for the people, which is clearly different than Bikram yoga in name, but in practice, he's doing all of the same steps. And now yoga for the people is arguing it's a functional thing. That should be patent protection. He has no patent protection. It would be expired by now anyway. Patents expire, copyrights expire, but copyrights expire 70 years after the death of a person if they're filed today. Uh, trademarks can be renewed forever. Uh, so he's argued it's functional, it should be patentable. I, I think Bikram Yoga is going to win in this case because if you have a dance, you know, if you choreograph a dance and you've got 36 moves, or however many it is, that's for sure copyrightable. It's true, there's functional aspects to it, but the same way in the dance, there's functional aspects, there's exercise aspects to any dance, but the particular character of the whole thing together, 36 moves, is an artistic work. So that's the type of thing that goes to copyright. These are the kinds of things you can do, even if you're in a field such as you're opening a dance studio, hey, you might have copyrights there, versus if you're opening something that's medical, you might have patents there, or there might be overlap for both. Excuse me. Yes? Could you draw a distinction? Yes, a patent is functional, a copyright is artistic. What I, what I like about the Bikram Yoga example is I think it crosses over both. It crosses over both. There's functional aspects and there's, there's artistic aspects. He's protected the artistic, not the functional. And in a way, he's created what would otherwise be maybe a patentable system. He's created it and turned it into a copyright and he's getting rights for much, much longer. You know, I, I, I think it's very smart what he did. 
So Michael, yes. very, very quickly, um, if you've got a particular process that you can apply in a bank, for example, would that be, that it, it, for, for, um, for accounting, would that be, a, could that be a copyright? So to say, I mean, the code itself? Yes, but in that case is probably not particularly useful. You can copyright code, but you can reverse engineer. Someone else can look at this and they can code it themselves as long as they're not copying your code. So I, how would you protect it? I mean, how would you, for example, Apple? It might not. I guess look and feel of the. Oh, okay, the look and feel? Apple, for example. Well, the look and feel, you could copyright that as the look of it, and also it goes to design pack. Apple files design pack is left and right. So for example, the look and feel of, I'm using this uh, voice recorder here, this is a uh, Samsung Zoom. Yeah, they, they probably copyrighted the look of that. I can't copyright, I, I'm sorry, design patent. The look of that. We'll get to design patents. And the same thing, this mouse here, um, I, my, my hand was filming <coughs> because I use a computer all day, so I had a sideways mouse. I didn't look it up, but I'm sure they put, if they didn't, they were silly not to, but. I'm sure this was, the, they filed a design patent and look at this mouse that you hold sideways. I mean, even Microsoft, the Logitech, or the regular mouses, they design patent everything. So I can't copy the look of the object. All right, um, any more just general questions on this before we move on to patents? Okay, let's move on. So, I'm sorry, before we move on to trademarks. <coughs> so I'm gonna talk about trademarks now before we get into the nitty gritty. So a trademark, so again, just a quick overview. Trademark is to protect a source indicator. So it can be a word, a name, a slogan, a symbol, a sound, a sm smell, a color, anything that's used to indicate a unique source of goods. So my example, this is a real client, Glamourine. It's a birthday trailer for girls. He franchises these things out, different location, you get a different guy that you're calling, and you order Glamour Ride, and he comes with this trailer, he's got another one for video games, a uh, video game trailer for boys, Glamour Ride for girls, and he'll come with this trailer, and uh, he'll have this whole birthday party in the trailer, and they'll do dress up and makeup and everything else. And that's the name of it. You want to copy his business model? Well, I, can't, I don't want to speak whether you can or can't, because my client, but for sure you can't call it Glamour Ride. Um, uh, a, or anything which is confusingly similar. So a specific shade of green for a laundry board, this is hard to protect, this doesn't happen every day, but I have dealt with this. I dealt with this with one restaurant suing another, saying that it was too close because they used the same shade, shade as turquoise. So, you know, whatever, we settled that case, but, uh, you know, it happens. People claim it's trade dress. People are getting confused because it looks too similar. This is only for non-functional things. A trademark is all, all only for, for non-functional aspects, things which are design aspects. And you go crazy in all these different things, like another one I'm dealing with recently is handbags. The, um, uh, the pattern on the handbags, whether you can protect that as a trademark or a copyright or both. And uh, you actually can. You can, you can protect the pattern on a handbag if you've been using it for five years or if you have enough sales. You know, all sorts of things that are protectable. So these are reasons to go to an attorney that knows what he's talking about, hopefully. Um, you go to an attorney, show them what you've got, and let them tell you all the different things that are protectable. At least so you know. You know, you might decide, hey, I don't want to spend the money on protecting the look of my storefront or whatever it is, but these are things which are potentially protectable. And after the fact, when someone copies you, it's usually too late. Um, and then a slogan. If you're buying insurance from another company, then we're both losing money. One of the first trade trademarks I ever filed when I went out and started my own firm in 2007. And a service mark is the same as a trademark, except it identifies a service. So it could be uh, something for you know, medical services, legal services, entrepreneurial services, whatever it is. So there must be, I touched upon this before, there can't be a likelihood of confusion. It can't be confusingly similar. If someone has the name Mission 50 for entrepreneurial services, you can't call yourself Mission 50.2 for entrepreneurial services, assuming it's trademarked. Uh, there is rights even if you don't file a trademark, but I'm not gonna get into that today. It's much less of rights, much harder. Um, it cannot be merely descriptive of the goods. So I can't call a mouse pad a mouse pad. I can't trademark mouse pad. That actually be generic, it's even worse. I can't describe what it is. I'd have to call this Tom, you know, whatever. There's some name that's, that's different. So primary register is for the things which already have secondary meaning. So like greater than one for child handles, 
greater than one, I don't know immediately it's a child handle. handle. It has, I'm giving it a different meaning. Greater than one in the English language means two, three, four, five, six, seven. Greater than one in this case is a secondary meaning. Its meaning is of referring to a child handle. The child holds on to this thing, the parent holds on to the other, everything you want. That's what this thing is. Supplemental register is things that don't have secondary meaning right now. So, for example, I gave, I gave the example already of the, um, uh, the purse, the, the, the um, design of the purse wouldn't necessarily associate it with it, but the law is associated with having a different meaning associated with that with purses. But after five years of sales or significant use in commerce, the law is that it is considered to have secondary meaning. Um, remote landlord is another one. Kind of describes what it is. It's I'm being a landlord from afar, but after five years of use, hey, now that's considered to have secondary meaning. Now it's now it refers to this product that he's selling for this online web portal to manage your landlord things and look at your cameras and so forth. All right, any questions? Yes? Um, if, if you've got a copyright or a patent, trademark is separate, you still have to apply separately. Yes, very different. So the patent and trademark office, actually they, it's one physical office. Actually now a lot of them, the trademark, trademark examiners are telecommuting these days, but uh, they're separate departments within the same office, the same David Kapos, head of both of them. Copyright office is totally se separate. What I call the copyright office, it's like calling the librarian. What I call the patent office, it's like calling government office. They're very different. Yes? If you want to skip this, you can, but how did Donald Trump trademark your fire? Because that's secondary like meaning. So I don't know. I have to look at the goods and services. You know what? Say, yeah, save it at the end. I'll, I'll look up the trademark at the trademark office. Um, I don't want to interrupt the presentation, yeah, but at the end, I'll be happy to look it up. So just remember that question, and we'll look up his trademark, and I'll see what are the goods. Because if he said for firing a person, it's probably not getting through. But if he said for um, I don't know what for a TV slogan or something, I don't know. I'd have to think about it. Um, but let's look it up. I never heard that, but let's look if there is a trademark and how it was filed. Okay. So trademark clearance searches. So this, I touched upon this, people can be using names, but they haven't necessarily registered them. So we can do a preliminary search, which is more or less what the trademark office will do. And let's put it this way, it's cheaper. That's why people choose to do this. So a trademark, a preliminary search is, I'll just look at issued trademarks. I'm gonna look at other trademarks out there, which is more or less a straightforward process, although sometimes you have 500 results if you're trying to trademark something with um, a very common name, and uh, then I could go through them and make sure that it's not confusingly similar, make sure the goods are different enough that you can get this name. <laughs> so that's, I wrote it here as knockoff search or preliminary search, uh, but the problem is marks can still be canceled even after registration. So supposing, for example, <coughs> give you a good example of this, Mission 50, since that's where we are, someone registers the Mission 50 trademark. They get the trademark because trademark office searches, uh, they might do a quick Google search, they might do dictionaries, and they might do, uh, they'll do the trademark database. But they don't come across Mission 50 in Hoboken, New Jersey. So they get the registration. Now, eventually, Aaron back there, he, he realizes, they've trademarked our name, how can they do that? I have particular brand equity in this, I put so much into this, I have 1,200 members. That's crazy they got this trademark. So he comes to me and says, hey, can you do this for free? And I say, yeah, sure. There he looks up, I say, I can do it for free. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> and uh, we file to cancel the mark. And it's hopefully a straightforward cancellation, depending on how long it's gone, and depending on how close they are in goods and so forth. You've got to make all these fun legal arguments. And you, we can cancel their mark. Now, really, you want to oppose it. There's an opposition period before registration, which brings me to a different point that if you do have a trademark, there's watching services, which are a couple hundred dollars a year, to make sure no one else is filing similar marks, so you can oppose them before they even get to registration. But even once they do, you can file for cancellation within reasonable time, not getting into the details. Um, and then, so, what I recommend, but to be frank, a lot of people don't do it because it's more expensive, is a full clearance search. This will search periodical, sound tech searches, all sorts of databases, business databases, business records. We'll find out, is there any company in this, co in this country that's showing up on this database? And it'll usually, if you find companies, they'll tell you approximately what the sales are and how big they are. 
um, you know, it at least gives you some idea. And you can say, hey, do I want to go forward with this, or is there really going to be a problem? Because there's a Mission 50 out there in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and they've got 50,000 members. Probably not, but, you know, in that case, you find that and change the name. You know, they just haven't filed a trademark. So registration is good. You want to register. It gives you more rights. It allows you to sue for more damages, puts people on notice, and it takes out this sort of iffy of, well, what if this company's went out there with that one? Because once you have it, other people who start up, they should hopefully be doing trademark searches and seeing that your name is protected for your goods. Okay, and then this is just, this is from my website, which is again, patblindj.com, but you can see that graphic better there. But this is basically how long it takes. There are such things as state registrations. I don't bother with them. I never filed one. It's kind of like you pay the, the state some money and they will put it in their database. It's really not much different than the who's who books where you pay money to these who who books and they put you in their book that nobody ever sees. Federal register is what really matters. It, um, com it covers the whole country. Um, four months till the initial exam. Unless you have a rejection, we have to go back and forth. We might have to provide arguments, which is why we do the, the, the searches, so we hopefully avoid the rejection. It'll be about nine months to a year till allowance, and then it goes to publication, and the public can oppose it before it goes to issuance or negotiator, consent agreements, whatever it could be. And in order to keep it alive, spur the disclosures at years five, nine, every 10 years thereafter, we have to renew the trademark. You can renew it forever, as long as you're using the trademark. Trademarks are different than copyrights and patents in that sense. As long as you're selling it, you can keep maintaining the trademark. The oldest one I ever renewed dated back to, I think, the 1920s. Doesn't happen every day, but I actually filed a renewal for Bo Brummel for a clothing store that, uh, to renew that trademark. You if you, if you don't renew the it, what happens if you don't renew it will go abandoned. If you don't renew it, if you don't pay the renewal fees, it will go abandoned. And the whole reason for that, I mean, Can I go out there and renew that? Can I? Well, then you would have to refile. So that if the, the renewal, if it's not renewed, then it will be abandoned and then you can refile. However, if it's not been renewed because the person was just negligent, then he still has rights to the name because he's still using it. It's called common law rights because there are like rights that come from trademarks in England before they had a registration system. So we've maintained that system. So you can still sue a person for trademark infringement, but the damages in the statute aren't nearly as high as if you have a registration. So he's giving up a lot by not maintaining it uh, properly, but it doesn't mean someone else can do it unless they stopped using it. So for, uh, for example, on point to what you're saying, one of my clients is ProCare Pharmacy. He got the name as CBS, abandoned it, and they actually filed. We're abandoning use. We're no longer using it. They canceled the marks. They were done with it. They didn't want to pay to continue keeping it up. They stopped using the name CBS ProCare. They became just CBS. My client got ProCare Pharmacy, and guess whose calls he gets? He gets business applications. <laughs> so, you know, because people call up and they have CBS and the old 411 systems that haven't been changed properly. Oh, you, they, he says CBS. So you want CBS Pro? You mean CBS ProCare? Yes, yeah, CBS ProCare. Uh, we found ProCare Pharmacy. How's that? Sure. You know, <laughs> that type of thing happens. Any other questions on the timeline? Yes. What are some things that could not go well? Likelihood of confusion is the most common rejection. It's too, it's confusing or the most problematic rejection, I should say. I mean, I get other things. The description of the mark isn't properly, things like this that are easily changeable, but the big one is likelihood of confusion. If I register the name, um, so this guy's got ProCare Pharmacy, and I register ProCom Pharmacy, then it would be rejected because it's likelihood of confusion. It's too similar. If it's too similar, it's going to confuse people that they're going to think this company is that company. Can't register it. And once you get through that, you might still get opposed by other users. But it's not so common that others oppose. It's more common that you have problems getting it through. All right, any questions from this side of the room? Yes. Um, I had a mark. Uh, rejected a few years ago because it's too generic. That happened um, as well. Are there ways around that? Yeah. Uh, was it generic or descriptive? Uh, good question. They might have actually said both. We'll look it up afterwards. Yeah. Keep that in mind. We'll okay. look it up. If it's generic, you can't. I can't register tissues for tissues. If it's descriptive, uh, blowing my nose item, 
And I'm doing tissues. Obviously, would register that name. Maybe you would. I don't know. People sell all sorts of shop <coughs> crazy names. Blowing my nose item. Blow it. Blowing my nose item. That would probably be descriptive. It would be rejected, but that would get on the supplemental register. And then in five years of use, you can get it on the primary. You still get to use that R with the circle on the supplemental. But keep that in mind for the end, and we'll look up trademarks at the end. Okay, that concludes my talk on trademarks. Now we're going to patents. So, first, what is a patent? This is from the Constitution, Article 1, Section 1, Clause 8. See, I have it memorized. I wasn't looking when I said that. Uh, Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to inventors exclusive rights to their um, somethings and discoveries. Interesting choice of periods there. Whoops. Anyway, so for limited times, I can protect an invention. Before, this was, this was uh, 1790, the first statute was enacted for federal patents. Before that, the states had some patent system. But you can imagine, you file your patent in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, someone's infringing, and you would have had to file it in all 13 colonies. It's not fun. The mail apparently went as fast as it did today, but still, you know, it's an expense. You don't know where it's to be sold. You don't know where it's going to infringe. This is one of the things, one of the first things to go federal. I mean, basically, I happen to be a big history fan and constitutional law and all that stuff, too, but uh, anything commerce in the uh, uh, Constitution went federal. That was everything. Every state agreed we need a federal commerce system, so we're not fighting each other to the bottom. And this is issued patents year to year. So 1790, there weren't so many. It didn't really start catching on until about the time of Abraham Lincoln, who is the first president, and I think only president to ever file a patent application. <coughs> and and uh, World War II, you can see the dip there, change in the law in the 1950s. But in general, this was a change in the law. This was, I think, the State Street decision, which limited business method patents, which we've been fighting about ever since. And uh, you can see this is how many patents are filed a year. And this is the percentage of foreign companies which are filing in the US to get protection here. I file, I, I do Google heads around the world, and I file patents for people around the world in the United States, and vice versa. I file them in other countries. But the United States is the most active patent office by far. Uh, second is probably European Patent Office. I think third is South Korea. Uh, Korea is crazy with patents. Uh, Japan is very big on them too. <coughs> but our country, by far, I mean, just commerce-wise, the amount of money that goes through this country compared to others just eclipses everybody else. And so it should logically follow patents do too. Okay, this is an example of a patent. This is one of them that I referred to in my intro. U.S. Patent 7,783,526, issued August 24, 2010. The title was an unregistered option device and method for uh, yeah, but whatever it was. Um, and I've written the claim into English to show you the type of thing that you can claim in a patent. So a phone with a data plan. Now, I actually wrote it. I didn't call it phone because it's kind of a phone. I didn't want patent phone per se. So I called it a bidirectional transceiver. Can someone translate bidirectional transceiver for me? Aaron, what did, well, why did I write bidirectional transceiver? I mean, if other devices came up that weren't called the phone, they could be covered that you know, yeah. two way communication? Yeah, I mean, anything that two way communication, exactly. A transceiver is anything sending and receiving a signal. Bidirectional is it sends and receives. It's broad, you know? And a phone, you know, what do I call a phone? Is this, I, I don't even know anymore what a phone is. I mean, I can show you my phone. I know my phone's a phone. This is my phone. I just patent this stuff. I, I, I use a phone that, like, calls people. So I, I don't know if, like, an iPhone is a phone. I can just call the phone there, too. Whatever these things are, anything that happens to have phone functionality. So I don't want anything that has, has two-way capabilities with data plan. Data plan I didn't write either, so I don't think I did. But, and it, it's got a phone plan. And I wrote billing needs. Anyway, I can bill a person, whether I call it a phone plan or I'm billing a person. And the next step of the claim was I bid on an auction with the phone. So now I take my bidirectional transceiver, is actually the wrote claim, and I bid on an auction. And at least some of the bidders are unknown to the auctioneer. That's what the examiner decided was patentable about it. There's nothing new about a phone that has a phone plan. And you could even argue bidding at an auction with a phone, great, I could take my iPhone or my Android phone 
and I could bid on eBay. I mean, there's more to this claim, but for purposes of this example, at least some of the bidders are unknown to the auctioneer. So what was what was the aha about this? What was the oh wow look at that feature of this that I made, that we're able to patent? I don't know who you are. What what did what this client actually wanted to do? And he's looking to license it because he didn't actually do it. If anyone wants to license it, he was going to write a billboard in Times Square. You take your phone, you text a certain number, bills your phone plan or however it worked. It bills your phone plan for the bid. Uh, and uh, that's it. It takes it off your phone plan. <coughs> now you've bid on this item, you've bid on this diamond necklace up on Times Square. You, you bid $1,000 and you charged whatever it is, dollar each time you bid. And the winning person ends up getting, getting this thing on there. And we never knew who these persons, who, the people were who were bidding, except for based on their phone plan. We look them up and then that's how we make sure that they pay. So this is patentable. So if you're coming up with stuff, if you're you know starting tech business, that's what we do. We try and find ways to take your concept, even if you don't think it's protectable. We try and find ways to protect it because now, even though he didn't go forward with this, he's a busy so all sorts of other stuff. He's got a valid patent. It's worth money. He can license it. I mean, looking for buyer right now, but uh, you know it's still worth money even on its own. And if you are a company, your company doing it, and you've got a stack of patents like this, you go to sell your company, or if you go to get investor funding, worth a hell of a lot more because you got the stack of patents. <coughs> All right, so this is the statute as uh, the basic statute of the things that are patentable, which is pretty much as Thomas Jefferson wrote it. It used to say useful arts, now it's different, but it now says useful process. So process is where business method patents come out there. Uh, John White, the head of the Patent Law Institute, he teaches a lot of classes in patent law, <coughs> thinks it's a big mistake that they ever changed the process. He thinks they should have said useful arts and it should have included business methods and all that crazy backlog that we have now and all the uh, patents that people say, oh, these things should be patentable. I don't agree with this. Uh, useful process, machine, manufacture, composition of matter, any improvement thereof. So basically, as the Supreme Court said in the 1950s, anything new under the sun made by man, which is a bastardization of a um, much older quote, which meant the exact opposite, that there's nothing under the sun. But uh, all right, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> all right, so what is a patent? So 35 U.S.C. 112 tells us what a patent is. An inventor has to disclose all of these things to the public how to make it, how to use it, how to sell it. So he has to disclose basically everything about it. We, we, he has to tell the person, in this document, which you read, you will be able to do everything that I am doing here. And in exchange for telling the public how to do all that, we are going to give him 20 years or so, I'm not getting into term extension, all that stuff, but to exclude others from making, selling, using, or importing. Doesn't mean he has a right to do anything, because he could be infringing on other people's patents. But he is going to exclude others. If you go and make, sell, use, or import it, he can sue you for infringement. I should say, anyone can sue anyone for anything in this country, but he can actually win on a suit for infringement. Um, so the idea is that we're going to advance civilization. We're going to get these things out there. If you have this idea, people inherently are self-interested. We want your self-interest to benefit the public. And this benefits everyone in the long run because we get these new ideas out there. Because I can go come up with this idea and I get time to incubate it and sell it without being knocked off by a big guy. And and uh, that's in a nutshell the purpose of that system. All right, let me pause here for questions. Any questions? Okay, let's go on. So patents are valuable. So for example, there's a speed dating patent, which I'm pretty sure was bought by speeddating.com because I was representing someone who was trying to sell his patent only to find that someone else had issued a patent before him for a same concept of connecting two people together in a computer for a limited amount of time, disconnecting them, finding out if they want to meet again, meet, you know, a video again, and, and arranging it. That sold for at least six figures, plus royalties and everything else. So it's valuable because the government, I like to explain the patent system like a mafia. The government controls its territory. The reason why a patent office in the U.S. is better than a patent office in New Jersey, it's a greater territory. In this territory, government is a monopoly. 
it can redistribute wealth, and it can take away your liberty, it can grant your liberty. And what intellectual property is doing, it's basically saying, we have a monopoly. We control the courts. We set the rules. You, you want to play in there? You, you, you want our protection? Pay the government a, some nice money, some nice fees, and in exchange for those protection fees, you get a limited duration monopoly of your own, or trademark if you keep paying and get protection forever. Uh, copyrights, I think of more as like the librarian realm. You just pay a small fee and it's good for your life, plus. They're not, they're not as interested in making money, they're interested in protecting, you know, showing uh, those artistic works and protecting uh, literature and so forth. So that's basically the system. You know, and then each country has their own mafia. They control this territory. You want protection in the next block over? Well, that's outside the US border. You now get to pay Canada a fee. You want protection over there. And they work with each other. They say, OK, fine. You file the United, United States Mafia, then you have a year, you one year from the time you file the United States Mafia to file the Canadian Mafia. And then and they work out all these deals with each other. And you can do that in 181 countries, as we'll get to. So when you patent, you get exclusive use of your invention. Some people, you won't even find out they were planning on copying you because they don't exist. They, because they'll go on and do something else. Uh, I did uh, research on Kensington locks once. They put these locks on the laptops. They patent that thing up the wazoo. Nobody's going in that market and been selling locks unless they're licensing from Kensington. Because they have 15 different patents on all different aspects of this little hole in the laptop, including the size and shape and the way the lock latches in, everything. Uh, if you see a computer lock, it's either sold or licensed from Kensington or infringing. Um, investors, you want money? Show them you got protection. No one's giving their money to someone who's not going to be able to make it. You got protection, it shows you much more likely to make it, it shows you much more serious. It establishes your brand as being original and genuine. You can license it to others. You can now, you can't make the sales, but someone else can. Sell it to them or license it to them, collect your money. Uh, you can sue infringers, and you can stop infringing goods at the border. So even if you only file in the U.S., you don't file in China, which is where the biggest number of knockoffs are coming from. You tell customs, uh, and uh, they, you can register it with customs, actually, a trademark or a patent. Copyright, I believe you can as well. And uh, that's it. They'll look for it. They won't let it in the country. Questions? Yes? Um, if any, what kind of protection does a provisional patent give? OK, I'm going to get to that. I have a whole slide proving that. <clears throat> yes? How good is, how, how much can you rely on customs to actually be the filter to get your stuff, you know, prevent your stuff from coming in? Um, I know they're definitely very active with it because I've dealt with them on a couple occasions. I once had an hour and a half conference with a customs agent in Michigan over an issue um, where, where things were being imported that were trademark infringement. And I've just gotten calls out of the blue that, you know, we wanted to make sure this is from your client because I look up in the trademark database and it's not from somebody else. We want to make sure these are valid goods. If you know, the more information you know, the better. If you can tell them, it, because there's custom agents all over the borders. So if you can tell them a specific port, like I was able to say Dearborn, Michigan, where the port was over there, there's five ports of Michigan, I found that out. Um, who knew? <laughs> so uh, if you're able to tell them where it is, they're able to more localize it and they're able to more you know, as opposed to a general database, they'll put it there and put it more up front. But they are very active in it, but, you know, they can't look at everything. There's a ton of crates going in and out, including people in them. You know, they don't find some of those. So, you know, they're not going to find everything. But uh, they are definitely very active. And the United States government is probably the most concerned about protecting intellectual property rights and preventing piracy and stuff compared, compared to the rest of the world. I mean, you know, you just compare it to certainly like, like other countries where I've, where I've been to. You know, you go into any store and it's wall-to-wall -wall bootleg CDs and videos that are just, they, it looks the same, they open it, it's clearly like a copy that they put on a CD and they're selling movies for a dollar. You know, in this country, you don't see that. And that's because there's tremendous amounts of protection of intellectual property here. I think I thought it's saw something. Right. Saw movement. So yes. I was just curious, back. what percentage of your clients do you find come to you um, looking for a, a patent, not because they have an invention that they want to sell in the market, but because they have an invention that they want to patent and protect and then go after other people who are potentially infringing it through litigation. I don't think I 
an ad one like that. Oh, really? <laughs> I mean, what you're referring to, I think, is like a, a patent, patent troll. troll. yeah. Yeah, so what a patent troll is, is they get this legally protective right, they get a patent, and then based on the fact that they have this patent, they're not actually doing it, they wait for someone else to do it so they can sue them. And it does happen, and it's totally legitimate if they're really the first ones. Uh, but, uh, and there are, in some other countries, in, nor in Northern Africa, believe it or not, the, uh, I forget which one, there's one for the French-speaking countries and for the English-speaking countries in Africa. One of those, it requires actual use in one of the member states to keep the patent, but that's the only place in the world I know that happens. But personally, I've dealt with it on the receiving end. I've dealt with someone who's really trying to seek a license, acting like where my client was infringing, and found out he was just you know, trying to seek a license. But personally, I don't, I, I, you know, I don't see it. I, I don't know how big it is, but personally, I don't have clients that, that, that do that. It's usually, my clients are the ones that it's for their business. You know, they want to predict their business that they're actually doing something. They might not actually do it, but you know, it's not their their intent at the beginning is usually to do it. Uh, or it might be to seek a license. But it's not that they're going to try and sue someone for who's copying them. It's that they want to go to a company and say, hey, I got this great idea. I want a license. Do you get royalties? So that's really what I see. Uh, quick question. Uh, you know, we hear, for example, I was reading something in the Wall Street Journal about how these ice holes, you know, these uh, Christmas tree lights. Yeah. And, and these people who had a patent on it did not even attempt to enforce it because, you know, the Chinese goods just came in. and. They couldn't do anything. About Enforcement's it. expensive. They might not have thought it was worth it. So if you could go to the government and yeah. get it enforced through the borders, yeah. why can't you do that? Why is that? We can. Yeah. I think they should. I mean, okay. you know, <laughs> what do we tell you? An intellectual property attorney. Of course I think they should re protect their intellectual property. Um, they and they can do that. They, they can get in a, at, uh, at the border. Or maybe, I don't know, you know, I don't know the specific case. Is it infringing? Was it not? Was it? It depends on the claim language. Like what I went through on the, the example pattern, depends exactly what's claimed. So are they getting around it? A lot of times not. A lot of times in China they're just totally knocking it off. They don't even change anything. Uh, so in that case, yeah. I mean, they take them to court. They go to customs. They can get the stop. They can stop the payment processor. They can get PayPal to stop sending the money if people are buying it from the U.S. Paying them in China. You know, whatever whatever the case might be. Yes. Uh, I guess a quick uh, I mean, verification. So basically, by filing a patent or trademark, something intellectual property, uh, you're limited to uh, protecting the item within the domain of the United States. But so if there was a knockoff product, let's say in China, you can prevent them from importing the product or providing the service in the United States. <coughs> but that's the extent. Of well, you could also file in China. You can file the Chinese patent office as well. <coughs> I'm going to get to that. I have a whole slide on foreign filing, and then I'll, let me discuss it there. Okay, so let, let's move on. Okay, preparing to file a patent. So this is what goes into a patent application. We're getting a lot of worldwide questions. This is what goes into a patent application pretty much around the world. It's The practice is different it's from place to place, but what goes into a patent is, is, is pretty standard around the world. So before you file the patent, in your preparation, what you've got is a trade secret. You generally want to keep that trade secret, you don't want to be shooting your mouth off. First rule of law is keep the mouth shut. So before you file a patent, you develop it, you test it, keep it confidential, you're keeping it as a trade secret, and the US will give you a one year grace period to file after making it public. So in other words, I tell people do not rely on this. You know, if you have to, you have to, but it's not a good idea, because you don't want to have an argument over who's the inventor, who came up with it first, all that type of thing. And further, if you're flying around the world, you file in Europe, there's absolutely no grace period. You disclose it to somebody, that's it, you're done. Uh, it may, and as I just alluded to, it's going to create issues in litigation. You go to sue, oh, here's this public disclosure. You say, oh no, that was by my sales associate who worked for me. No, it's not proven. Now you're going to go back. This guy, meanwhile, you fired a year later, and you're going to go back and get him testify in court that really he was working for you and uh, it was your idea. You know, <clears throat> it's just better not to have to go there. Get the first thing filed. Don't create a paper trail, except for your own paper trail that you control. I should, I should clarify. You want to create a paper trail, but you want to have the your total control of the paper trail, not things out in public. Um, U.S. law in 2013, this is actually signed into law, 2013 is changing to a first-to-file system. That means right now, 
until 2013, I've actually done this. I had a patent just issued, simultaneous film roll camera. He takes these old 70 millimeter cameras, put two, two 35 millimeter rolls in it, winds it up and uh, shoots on the two films at once. Just got the patent for that. Guy at Flickr had the pictures. <laughs> he put them up there and uh, same concept. But I w it was before the filing date. So what I actually did was I submitted the first draft of the patent application with a novelty search, I don't remember what. I said, look, here's the search I did. Here's the pictures he sent me. Here's the emails that are dated. He was in possession of the invention first. I cut the patent that way because he got it before this guy who posted the same thing on Flickr. So that's all changing. And I had this whole conversation with the examiners. I don't know what we do with this once the law changes. You know, probably wouldn't get the patent. So I happen to like the first to invent system. I think it's fair, but you know, I'm one guy in a whole country setting these laws. So it's going to change to the first to file system in 2013. And once we have the first to file system, you're going to want that early filing date. Which will bring us to maintaining confidentiality. So ways to maintain confidentiality. You can have a formal confidentiality agreement. If you're dealing with an attorney, um, you have attorney-client privilege. You go to a criminal lawyer, it's funny, no one goes to a criminal lawyer and says to him, I just shot a man, but before I tell you the details, I need you to sign a confidentiality agreement. Lawyer cannot go and turn you in. Unless you're a clear present danger and you're about to shoot more people, he can't go and turn you in for that. He's there to represent you. They come to a patent attorney, they say, I need you to sign a confidentiality agreement first. So I have, I have duties of confidentiality by engagement agreement. Uh, but the truth be told, it's not strictly speaking necessary because I've got a duty of confidentiality to the law anyway. I spent, should my parents spent, a ton of money on undergrad and law school, and I've got to take all these tests, the SATs and the LSATs and the bar and the, the, the patent bar and study for all these exams. I'm not losing all this and chance of going to jail because you think your idea is making $10 million. You very well might, but you're the guy digging the gold in California. I'm the guy selling you the shovel. I do very well selling shovels. <coughs> so that's basically my role here. I sell you shovels. You dig for gold. You may get nothing. I still get my cut on the shovel. Or you may become a lot richer than me. Percentage-wise, I have to like my job. So that's basically the system. Um, and when you do talk to people, and I tell this even to people who call me on the phone because I don't want to know. I don't want to be sued because they say, oh, I'm patenting for someone else or whatever. Talk generally, not specifically. Do you want to invest in better mousetrap? Don't tell me, oh, this is a whatever it is. This is a carbon fiber mousetrap that uh, cuts off the mouse's head as it goes across. Don't tell me that detail. Tell me it's a better mousetrap. That's all I need to know. And then I can give you, you know, estimate of price and go from there. Um, and keep records to determine misappropriation so you know if someone else goes and files a patent and it wasn't theirs, they start suing you because you didn't file a patent they did or whatever the case might be. Uh, date of conception, due diligence to show when you got it. Some of this, again, is changing in 2013, but keeping records is always a good idea. Well, I should say always. In this case, it's a very good idea. All right. When is a dimension patentable? It's got to be useful, which is easiest requirement to meet. Kills the weeds. It helps the weeds grow. That's useful. Yeah, that's an easy requirement. I've never seen an examiner, actually I have, but only in really badly filed applications. It's very rare a patent examiner will say, this isn't useful. That's a subjective test. Anyone can claim anything is useful. Novel. No one has sent messages as a bunch of dots and dashes before. That's new. I never thought of using my phone plan to authenticate my bid at an auction. That's not obvious. It's not necessarily, you know, any of the moving parts, but the whole method is not obvious. So it, that is considered new and not obvious and useful. It's all the requirements, that is something patentable, yes. Can you patent a toy? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, again, it depends what it is. As long as it has a feature which is new and not obvious, and that's what I'm patenting. If not, I can go to design patents, which hopefully is the next slide. Yes, the next slide. A toy, you could also patent as a design patent. Under the ornamental design for an article of manufacture. And these only last 14 years. These are relatively simple to get. They're relatively cheap. The protection is a lot less than the utility patent. So oftentimes I tell people, file a utility, file a design if you can. You know, I'll throw it in for a little bit more money and you know, I'll give you a little bit extra because it protects the look of the functional object. So that goes back to my mouse example. This is a sideways mouse and they would protect uh, the look of this functional object. 
And the utility is, I put almost anything, new and unobvious under the sun made by man. So anything which is new, that has a new function, but it has to be a function made by man. So it cannot be law of nature, abstract, and natural phenomena. So in other words, I can't patent the ball of lightning, that's a natural phenomenon, but I could patent the method of creating ball of lightning. Ball of lightning is, it's been videotaped very infrequently. I think there's now some new literature on how it's formed. But it's basically like a ball of light that rolls around and then disappears. So it's called ball of lightning. One of these crazy natural phenomena we have in this world. So, and those last, the utility patent lasts 20 years. Nobody ever asked me about this question. That's probably because I'm in Hoboken, in New Jersey, or I speak in places like this where you look out and it's like, there's some trees, but there's houses and industry all over. But there is such a thing called plant patents. My associate in Pennsylvania, who I work with, she gets more farm equipment and stuff like that. But in this area of New Jersey, nobody asks me about plant patents. Nobody even mentions it. But you can actually patent a new strain or a new breed of patents. So this is just more interesting than anything else. We provide a picture, you provide a description of what you did to make it, and uh, what, what the mix is, and what it looks like, and um, that's it. Your strain of plant is patented. Don't ask me what the term is in plant patents, because I don't know. <coughs> All right. What is patentable? Process. So this is, again, this is just deeper review of the previous slide. Method of routing calls to an IP phone would be a process. Machine is a device that does it. Your bondage box would be would be, be patentable. Your method manufacturer, a black box having punched out holes for at least one uh, phone, one network port. I'm sorry, that is the actual manufactured product. Composition of matter, mixture of 95% synthetic fiber, 5% snow wool forming whatever it is. Boronized titanium is what I'm working on now. Or any combination of above. So as you can see, patents are broad. They're limited term, but they're broadly protectable as long as you really have something that we can go and say, aha, look at that feature. That's uh, something I learned from the uh, former head of uh, AT&T patent division when I, he partially trained me. And when I talked to clients with him, he would actually <coughs> say to them, what's the gee whiz of the invention? What's the gee whiz? What's the thing that I'm going to look at and say, oh, look at that. that that's, that's what's wonderful about this. That's what we're going to try and protect. Uh, are there any questions? Yes. Is there an example of something that you would call too abstract? Um, we used to get them constantly. The Bilski case is a Supreme Court case on business methods. So between the time the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit had it and the Supreme Court had it, they reject everything as being abstract. So for example, not everything, it's just everything, but uh, any sort of business method patents, they're rejecting them left and right. So they would, if you wrote, it used to be a method of, of using a computer-readable storage medium. You know, anything that stores data that a computer can read. Then they started rejecting all those as abstract. They said, well, I don't know what that is, that could be anything, and so on and so forth. So now the way we write it is a processor configured to carry out steps including A, B, C, and D that they consider okay. Every five to 10 years, it, it's a moving area of law, and every five to 10 years, they change the way it has to be written to not be considered abstract. It's actually a very big deal with business method patents, the type of stuff you know, expect to come out of NJ Tech, you know, in terms of how you write them. But it, it's, in my opinion, it comes down to just the wording. How do you write the language? It's, you know, it was, in Bill's ski case, it looked like it was gonna severely limit it, and then the economy crashed, patent filings went way down. There was a the patent office was having budgetary problems. And all of a sudden, the Supreme Court says, that's not the only test. There's other ways to do it. And the patent office opened back up and got more liberal again. So, you know, there's, um, I'm getting off tangent, but a lot of this is politics and everything else, and who's in office, and who's the director, and what they're doing. Right now, the director, in my opinion, is very good. David Kaplos, he's a former head of patents at IBM. And he's trying to streamline the process giving examiners not enough time to examine patents right now. I'm hearing a lot of that from examiners. So they're not doing as good a job, but I am getting a lot more allowances and it's a lot more making sense what you can and can't get through. You just, you have to go to a patent attorney that's in the field and knows how to draft the claim is what it comes down to. It's not an area of law you can do yourself. But anyway, I don't know what the original question was anymore, but I believe there's another question over here. 
Is it or, uh... Software, you can copyright the code, you can copyright <coughs> the look of the end product, and you can patent it if there's a new and obvious method that's being carried out. So, you know, my auction patent, there's a reason I brought that one up, because I thought it would be most relevant for this group, but the auction patent, <coughs> using a false auction, I mean, really, that's a piece of software he's running, a piece of software combined with billboard. You know, but even with uh, other things, like the piece of software itself, I, I can't patent the software directly, but I can patent the method of doing steps A, B, C, and D, as long as those steps in combination are new and obvious. And that's how we protect software. Okay, well, you can Well, that's for infringement issues. In order to infringe, I have to not be carrying out every step of what they have in any given claim. And then that would be infringing. But I'd definitely go to a patent attorney just to understand how to read the claim, because there's also doctrine of equivalence, the equivalent of what's written there. It can get crazy that in terms of infringement. In terms of patenting it, if this software is already out there and I want to patent the software, I need a new and an obvious uh, way to, uh, of, of carrying it out. There's got to be something new and an obvious over that other one in order to patent myself. So it's going to have to be something different than what the previous guy's doing. All right. Um, any other questions? Okay. Let's move on. Wow. Okay. Finally, good patent. All right. We're getting towards the end. I'm going to step five. First to invent system. This is what we have right now. Until 2013, you can swear behind a reference up to one year before the filing date. So I file. 1-1-2012, I can swear behind back to 1-1-2011. Sandler cites a reference dated 1-1-2011, well, I'm not sure about that exactly, but he cites something in June 2011. I can say as the first inventor, I submit evidence, and I can still get the patent. 2013, there's still going to be a one-year grace period for, from the time of your first public disclosure until filing. This is actually identical to Canada and I think Australia's rule. Uh, but only for your own disclosure, not for other people. Other people disclose it before you in 2013, you're done. Guy has it on Flickr beforehand, the concept that I'm trying to patent, done. Till law changes, keep records, proof conception, diligence, notebooks, should be dated and witnessed, I should cross that out and write backups should be properly dated and in a secure medium that can't readily be edited, or whatever it might be. Uh, brainstorming meeting should be documented. In other words, document everything to show you're the inventor. Now, Aaron's question, provisional application. When pressed for, decides, pressed for time to disclose an invention, or you're just testing the waters. I'm not a big fan of provisionals, because you have one year to convert it to a utility application, must be enabling. Now, the problem with these is it's true, all you have to do is enable them to carry out your invention. You just have to describe how it works, that's it, you can throw it at the wall. It's never examined, it gives you, buys you one year of time. The reason I'm not a big fan is the most part, the reason they're being filed is <coughs> we're doing a less good job. We're not sure, we don't want to pay, so let's just throw something there and get some protection. If that's what you have to do, you know, you want something because you're just close to one person and then drop it after if it doesn't take it, that might be okay. But really, it should be as good as a non-provisional. You should have everything in there because you don't want to have a problem. You don't want to say, oh, you weren't really in possession of the invention. Oh, look at this added feature you put in only in the non-provisional. You can't claim back to that date for this, that type of thing. Uh, so. Really, it, it's, it's in my mind, it's best just to do the non-provisional. It's best just to do it properly, do it fully, do it once, do it right. Uh, that may change in 2013. The reason I say it may change is because it becomes a first-to-file system. So at that point, it might be a good idea. Like, I'm contemplating, since I do a novelty search, I take whatever inventor disclosure I had in the novelty search, and I'm going to offer for a couple hundred dollars. I'll just file it as a provisional application, and then we'll get to work on your non-provisional, just to make sure we have that filing date. But, I don't know, we'll see how that plays out. We've got uh, some time to worry about that. And then, what we do is novelty search. Inventor gives me a disclosure uh, of what their invention is. 
depending on what it is. You can just tell it to me, but again, I recommend having some sort of written dated record at least, just for your own sake. Uh, they'll tell me what the concept is, they'll give me a prototype, they'll give me uh, whatever it is, screenshots, whatever the case might be, drawings of a product, as long as I can understand it well enough to search it. And what we're going to do is make sure that your concept is new and not obvious. Again, that's what you need. And we can search the U.S. Patent Office. We look at you. I generally, my search is, my most common search by far is I search issued U.S. patents. I find the class and subclass. So the class might be surgery and the subclass is knee and then prosthetic or whatever it is. And I look at those references and then I might also do some keyword searching to make sure I've covered everything. And patent searches, you can pay between $205,000 on a patent search. Uh, the $200 is somebody's going to go into Google Patents, type in a few, uh, type in, uh, a few words, he's going to download the first 12 patents and shovel them out to you. $5,000 patents, $5,000 search is probably overpriced unless he's doing worldwide. And in between, I, I, is what I standardly do is I find the class and subclass, I look through the most relevant references there, and I do some keyword searching general or within the broader class to make sure I haven't missed anything and I'll give you a patentability opinion which will be a report of these are the features I found, these is what features that you would claim in your patent, <coughs> this is how I search, and these are the closest references that have features A, B, and C, but this one lacks D, this is A, B, and D lacks C, but hopefully it's not obvious to combine, whatever the case might be, that's a standard patent search. All right, so we're going to determine scope of patentability. So in other words, if your invention is here, here's all the prior art, the sea of prior art, here's every other entrepreneurial meeting, here's what Mission 50 does, kind of overlaps there, but you've got some new features, then we're going to claim this area. Now, on the other hand, you could be anywhere on this. If you're in the middle of the prior art, forget it. Go find something else to do. If you're all the way out here, claim broader. Instead of your invention, even if your invention is this, you might be able to claim this. Let's get as broad as we can. So it's going to familiarize us, me and you, with the existing technology, and we're going to know what the competition is doing. Not only that, I might look at competition's patents and be like, oh, you know, this is how it's being protected. I don't know every area of, you know, every area of technology. Nobody can. So if you come up, come to me with, hey, I, I don't know, a new method of doing an ear implant, and I see that the other, other patents are out there. Uh, what the other patents for ear implants do, I'm going to see a way of claiming it, a way of protecting it. So that's the whole purpose of a search. I guess I'll pause here. Are there any questions? OK, let's move on. So then we prepare the patent. So I get the disclosure, a telephone, email, in person, and Skype a lot of times. Uh, and I'll give you the novelty search with the opinion of patentability. Draft the event, draft the claims, you get up to 20 included before they start charging you more fees, and a complete specification. Uh, some of these aren't required, but they're generally in applications. A background invention, where I try and sell it to the examiner and say what this is doing new over everything else, and so someone who's picking it up and reading it can figure out what they're reading. A summary of the invention, that's what courts read because they want to read something closer to English on the claims. Uh, detailed description of the invention and so forth. And the drawings, draftsman, and patent practitioner, whoever else, if there are flow charts, I like to flow charts myself, but uh, I use a draftsman when I need them to actually draw things, or you can provide drawings and black and white line art goes in patents. No color yet. And then we get to the patent office. So, number six, at the patent office. Submit the complete application. Right now it's $530 for a base fee for a small entity. You have less than 500 employees. You have 20 claims, up to three independent claims, being three that stand on their own. And um, right, that comes, that's filing, search, examination, it comes up to 530. Submit a declaration <coughs> signed by the inventors. We swear we invented this. We affirm that we invented this. And uh, this is ours, and under penalty of criminal, criminal penalties, I'm not lying, and so forth. It's going to be information disclosure statement. The way the United States works, and the way Australia used to work, my Australian associate tells me it's no longer required in Australia, you have to submit everything that you know about which is relevant to the examination of your patent. It's not supposed to be an adversarial proceeding. You're supposed, it becomes that way often, but you're supposed to work with the examiner, and you're supposed to say, 
this is what I know, this is what, these are the claims I think are compatible. He does his own search, he says this is what I know, and then when I talk to him, we'll have an examiner interview, we have responses on paper, to keep paper record, and we determine what's patentable. It's an absolute duty to disclose what we know. And assignment documents if you're assigning rights to the company. So from you to your company or whatever it is. And uh, tangentially, people who are working for you, in their hiring agreement, there should be something that says anything that they do is owned by the company, on behalf of the company, they will assign to you. Yes? That was my question. If you have an idea and you hire someone to figure out how to make it. Then that's a work for hire agreement. Um, and I've seen a lot of these agreements need some work. Uh, it's highly advisable to use an intellectual property attorney in drafting these agreements because regular attorneys aren't necessarily versed in this area. Uh, you want to make sure that the agreement says that the people who are working on it, it's a work for hire arrangement. You own anything, any of their work product that they do that you're paying them for. And if they come up with anything new that they will, they, they is owned by you, and even if they are the inventor, you might have to put them down as an inventor in a patent application because they come up with some new concept and now you add their name or whatever because by law you have to, but they have to assign the rights to you or your company. If they discovered it in the creation of your product. Yes. Wow. Okay. I mean, a more classic okay. example is if you're having someone doing chemical lab testing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't happen as much with, uh, you know, tech stuff. It could. But, you know, chemical research. And they discover this new way. I mean, my grandfather, he has patents in his name that I looked up and spoke to him about. Uh, and he, he, he came up with, uh, I forgot what it was offhand, but a way of dyeing something. Chemical patents used to be the big thing 50 years ago. Today it's all business method. It used to be all chemical. And he came up with this new method of uh, whatever it was, dyeing something, of dyeing something, or cleaning agents, or whatever it was. And he's the inventor. But he comes up with this new invention. The company wants to own it. They paid him to do the research. They paid him some royalties. He said it wasn't nearly as much as he should have gotten. But, uh, but they owned it. The company owned it. Yeah, but the company owns it. So okay. you want to make sure they come up with stuff. It's owned by the company. And unlike uh, Europe, person working for you is presumed to be owned by the company. The company files the application. Here, inventors file the application. They have to sign declarations for each and every one. And each and every patent, it has to be assigned separately. So you have this contract that says they will assign them. And if they don't, well, it can be a royal pain. But contractually now, this is now state law, not federal. Contractually, they have to assign the rights to the company. And they have to sign that document. But they do the work of filing the patent? Usually the company would do the work and pay for it. So I hire the guy. You just be sure you have the thing. rights to which filing. Okay, so that's part of your contract. Yeah, it's part of a work for hire contract. Okay. My personal work for hire contracts is every work for hire contract I draft. Okay. Yes. Um, if you're a consulting company. Yes. And you you are working under work for hire, um, and you have your own ideas even prior or during it that's sort of that's separate from those ideas. You just you better. Keep it separate, not model it. Don't use, don't use their computers. You know, don't do it on time when they're paying you. You, you create a litigation issue. So you know, you're doing it fully at home. And I mean, I've seen some contracts that cover that cover anything you do anywhere. I'm not so sure those are enforceable because if you do it at home, it has nothing to do with the company. It's your own idea. Uh, but it also depends on how I mean, closely you're related. If you're an external consulting company, like not working. Uh, it depends on your relationship. How many consulting companies do they have? How many clients do you have? If they're one of 50 clients, then you know, hopefully they're the only, you're not going to have conflict of interest. They're your only client for uh, whatever it is, developing iPhone applications in the field of uh, personal health. I don't know the medical thing today. But, um, and uh, your other ones are developing iPhone applications in the field of web browsing. So then there's not going to be too much of a problem. And if you come up with something on your own, that it's a new children's toy, hey, there's not going to be a problem. There's no overlap there. But if you start muddling the waters, oh, well, even if you didn't do it on our time, you got the concept based on our disclosure, we have this thing, we get the set rights. You know, it can, it can get tricky. But if you get to that point, it's all been a term. <laughs> Just thought there's a uh, big enough difference in between the work you're doing for them and... Generally speaking, that's not legal advice. Don't sue okay. me if it doesn't work out. But right. for the specific facts of what happens, Pay for consultation. Right. <laughs> you know, okay, any other questions? <coughs> yes. um, about the IDS, it's included in a patent application or you have to file it? 
You can file it at the time of filing. Personally, my practice is I have so much to worry about with filing. I usually file them every four months or so. I file them in batches. Yeah, I, I mean, no, I mean, just that's how I do it. But it, it has to be filed before uh, examination. The examination comes in one to two years, as we're going to get to. There's an extra fee if you file it late, and your patent will be kind of unenforceable if you never file them. Before the first uh, action? Uh, before the first office action, yes, which so I'm going to get to. Yes, yes you ask Kendall about it. He, do, he does work for me, and he, he prepares my information disclosure statements. Um, <laughs> the first thing I have to do. Okay, so first office action on the merits, sometimes abbreviated as phone. Examiner reviews the prior art and typically rejects. It's kind of like dealing with Horizon. Horizon is my healthcare company. So, and I have no problem saying this in a public and recorded video. You submit a claim, they reject it. You go back, they reject it, you go back and forth until they finally agree to pay something and then get my daughter's spelling, my daughter's name wrong and still don't pay some of it. So eventually they get it right. The patent office is actually better than that. They spell the names wrong. <laughs> don't reject because there's one letter wrong in your daughter's name. Okay, anyway. Healthcare is a different issue, I'll be happy to talk to it after. It's messed up in this country. The patent system is doing much better than the healthcare system. Alright, anyway. 35 USC 101. There's no, there is uh, no utility, it's abstract. I think we killed that issue, so 102, it exists in a single piece of prior art. In other words, your camera roll thing is the same thing you disclosed here. Every single feature is in that, your claim is no good. 103. I can smash together two references, and it's obvious. I smash together this guy's pictures, and I smash together this camera from 50 years ago, and I come up with your idea. It's obvious to put the two together and do your invention. You can agree, you can disagree. It's subjective. Overcoming based on, that's not obvious, usually doesn't work. You have to overcome based on, that feature is not shown. That feature is really not shown here, or if I combine the two features, it would be non-functional or something like that. 102. Uh, rejections are actually usually easier to get over 103 because 103 they start combining four different references together to find every feature and you got to argue that we're 102 hey there's one feature different that's it or you amend the claims to get around these all right 35 USC 1012 enablement you haven't particularly told the public how to carry out your invention or inadequate disclosure is the same idea you missed something I don't know how to carry out your invention I don't know what you mean by that term if it's really bad you're stuck Usually it just means we change the wording in the claim language to use words that are in your, your specification. Uh, or if I'm reviewing ones that other people have drafted, you can find some words and you find ways to fix it up. That type of thing. You know, I've taken over applications from other people. And although I obviously have self-interest in this, do not file your own patent application. Unless you've gone through the process a couple times, or you're an engineer and you start drafting the, you know, you start having experience with these, Things that people file on their own are generally, you know, I sit there fixing them up. And you're not going to end up with the, the, the best result at the end because you're kind of patching it together to make it work. Provisional, you might file yourself. I don't think it's a great idea either, but there is <coughs> a possibility to do it. You know, you can do that without, uh, you know, as long as you don't harm yourself and start talking negatively about your things. You basically put whatever you want in provisional. But non-provisional is a it's technical document. It's highly technical and needs to be done professionally. Yes, sir. Can you change anything between the provisional and the actual patent? If you yes. Start working on it. And you realize, oh, I'm absolutely. Yeah. But you will get protection back to your non-provisional filing date for the things that are new in your non-provisional, and you get protection back to your provisional filing date for the things that are in your provisional. What if in the provisional they were just um, less well written? It would probably be protectable. Yeah, it would probably be protectable. Okay. I mean, what you could do is write it and just have an attorney look over it and comment and, you know, do an hour's worth of time on that or whatever, that type of thing. <coughs> All right. Then, once we get our rejection, we have an examiner interview, written response to the office action, and amendments. Or, you know, these are various possibilities. Examiner interview, you can do it in person. Some attorneys do that. It's obviously more expensive because you got to pay someone to travel to Arlington, Virginia. Uh, but uh, I do them on the phone. I call them up. You talk to them. Statistically, the allowance rate is much higher for those that do examiner interviews and those that just respond on paper. I, I, I'm a big believer in it. There's a lot more you can get done by talking to a person and explaining them and talking about their day and their kids and everything else. And <laughs> you work it out. 
you know? Uh, and then we have a written response, and we can amend the claims, other things that we can do. We, you might have a restriction requirement where you get more than one invention. Nowadays, these are getting more popular. They restrict everything. You have a method, of it, you have a device and a method of using it. They say, oh, those are two different inventions. So uh, you have to choose which one to examine. I have actually started, because I think they've been getting crazier, I have actually argued against these, that there's no reason to restrict. There has to be a substantial burden, a substantial search burden on the examiner to examine all the claims at once for them to do this. Um, and then, if that happens, you file a divisional, pay the government more fees, the examiner gets twice the amount of time to review, and you file a divisional uh, for the second set of claims on the same application. Continuations, it's rejected twice, you get a final rejection, you can continue, you, you file another fee, you provide more arguments, it happens. I mean, my, my associate Cheryl, who works for me, she used to be a patent examiner. She said sometimes what would happen is they would do a first office action, it wouldn't be so good, and uh, the person would come back, and half the time people don't respond to office actions. They file, you don't hear from them. So no, no one looks over it at that point, but meaning none of their superiors look over it. And then if you come back, you'd argue against it, and then they'd give you the real rejection, it would be fine. And then you're forced to file a continuation because now you have a good rejection. So hopefully it's not always like that, but you know it, it can be that sadistic. And you can also appeal. I've done this too, there's now a pre-appeal pre process. The examiner just doesn't get it, his rejection is nonsensical. You talk to him in the examiner interview, he's not budging, appeal it. You want someone else to look at it. You can actually petition to have him removed as examiner, all these other things. I've never gone that far, uh, but you appeal. The problem with appealing is though you'll be right, it generally, 80% of the time, it goes back to the examiner. Now he's not too happy with you, and now he gives you a real good rejection and really spends some time on it. And then you got to argue that. And we can do foreign filing. Okay, so I'll pause after foreign filing for questions because I think we'll have questions on that. So the U.S. patent protects you only in the U.S. You pay the U.S. mafia, you haven't paid the Canadian mafia. Well, what we can do is each mafia has a treaty with Others, there's 181 countries and entities. The European Patent Office, a RIPO, is uh, the English or French speaking countries in Africa. OAPI o o is the other one for Africa. I think OAPI is French. Yeah, and the, the other one's English. Um, and you have one year from you filing the US to file in other countries. Each country has its own rules, its own fees. You will pay me for my services. You will pay the, the Canadian or whatever the foreign associate for his services. You will pay the foreign government fees. Um, and this is generally the way it works because you don't want what happens in one pack to affect your rights in other countries. So if you're filing in multiple countries, and I will openly say it can get very expensive filing in many countries. So choose countries wisely where you're really going to sell. And what we will do is, um, you know, if we get a new reference, then I've already looked at the application. I'm most familiar with it because I drafted it. So I generally will give instructions to the foreign associate. This is how to argue, this is how to amend the claims, and then he does on paper what's needed for the patent practice in that country, and vice versa. If I get a foreign client, I'm filing on behalf of firms that I work with in other countries, then I'll file their patent application, and I'll send him the rejection, and he'll give me instructions, here's what to do, and then I take those arguments and I write it up properly for US practice or whatever it is. Uh, major entities, EPO, Europe, OAPI, Africa, which isn't used too much, but I keep mentioning. Canada, China, Japan, Australia. You can file directly in each country or via PCT channels. I'm not going to that today, but basically that gives you 30 months from your earliest filing date instead of 12 months till you enter uh, the country, the individual country. And eventually, you get this thing. You get an issued patent. You should actually throw one here. But uh, you get the patent, which has the whole thing, which you've worked long and hard for. And now you can put this on your wall as a status symbol or go out and sue people and get money, which is really the work of the thing. <coughs> All right, to review, magic disclosure. Novelty search, then tell me what you got. I'll tell you if it's worth searching. We'll find something, we'll search it. Draft the application, we file it. Examination at the patent office right down here. We go back and forth to the patent office until we get an issue. 
Sometimes it is right away, you know, like every now and then Horizon pays a claim right away. Every now and then you get a patent through the patent office right away, and eventually you get a patent, and the fund doesn't stop. You pay maintenance fees, fourth, eighth, and twelfth year of the life of the patent to keep it valid. Although this, of course, again, has the benefit of money to the government. Generally, any problem you have with a patent can be fixed with money. That was the answer on the, uh, the exam where if uh, you didn't know what, what was the answer choice in the patent exam, find the one that includes pay a fee. So <laughs> in order to keep the patent alive, you pay the fourth, eighth, and twelfth year. You can keep it alive for 20 years, your utility patent. Uh, design patents have no uh, fees. They're alive 14 years no matter what. Uh, the reason for this is actually, there actually is a very positive reason for this. If you are a wannabe troll, you patent something, you file it, you never use it, and after four years, you're still not using it. Well, if it's not worth it to you to pay the couple hundred dollars in fees, let someone else use it. Now it's open to the public. Anyone else can use it. They don't have to wait 20 years. They wait four years. So that's the whole purpose of that. Oh, I said I'd pull it up too far, and finally, I did. So why don't I take questions here? Yes? Is this example I'm going to give, is this a design patent? Um, yes. There's something that exists, like a, like a snow cone making machine. And yeah. somebody had an idea to make that for kids. So it's little, it's cute, yeah. it's different, but it's using the same technology. So to get to, for the person to create the snow cone machine If it's the same kids, thing, if it's carrying out the same method, the same process, looks the same, but it's smaller. But it'll look really different, because it's, okay. well, but it might be using the same. If it looks different, then you might have a design patent. Yeah, it would be a design patent if it looks different. If it's functionally the same, not a utility patent. But if it's functionally different, then there's be a utility patent. I mean, but the inner if, work. If they had a patent on it, like if the snow cone machine had a patent on it, would yes. you be able to remake that for a different, you know, for this different market for kids and this? If it's new, well, probably not. It has to be a new, new and an obvious use. So, for example, Tylenol is a weed killer; would probably be patentable. No, it's not because I just disclosed it as my idea. But uh, Tylenol is a weed killer; would be patentable because it's a new and an obvious use. You know, but Tylenol to give to kids as opposed to give to adults or to give to, I'd say, give to your beagle instead of give to, give to your kids. I, you know, that probably wouldn't be an obvious. It might be new, but it's not an obvious. So would that be a case to talk to a patent lawyer? Like, is this... Everything's a case to talk to a patent lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, it's going to be worth it to me to create this modification. That I can't tell you. Would you make money on it? It only comes down to why are you doing this? To make money. Right. You're filing a patent because it helps you make money. The government wants you to file it to you know, to help advance society and have a good functioning economy. So, you know, if you're going to make money on it, yeah, I mean, that's the ultimate question. But, I mean, could they sue you because they already create, they have a patent on this? Snow Assuming patent. they have a patent, it's possible. It's possible if you're infringing upon their patent, even if your thing is patentable, it still could be infringing upon a previous patent. So, I mean, that's still a problem. I mean, that's the thing to, yeah, you know, talk, talk to a patent attorney. You know, preferably paying it for a consultation. <laughs> All right. Yes. Let's say you have. Uh, let's say you want to make an improvement on something that isn't really worth reinventing the wheel with. Yeah. Is it possible to maybe like? What I'm trying to ask is like, can you license a patent that already exists and then just maybe like spin off of that, or how would you? How would you do something like that? Like what following? Like if you want. Like if you have an invention, <coughs> yeah. but it's not really an invention. It's more like an improvement. It's something that already exists. Yeah. Um, is. If someone comes up to you with that kind of thing, what do you usually say? Like, just try to find a way to make it. Oh, yeah, we try to work around it. I mean, practically speaking, most people don't come and say, I need the pets. Practically speaking, like, individuals might come to you and say, I have this great idea, this is so wonderful. More, but businesses will come to you and say, We're selling this product, here, patent attorney, patent it. You know, I mean, just, I don't know if I can speak about this example, but I mean, I mean they'll come to you and say, This is what we're selling, patent it. So as a patent attorney, I look and find a way to protect what they're going to sell anyway. You know? And that, that's often my job and what I end up doing. Uh, yes? What they choose to call themselves. Well, actually, no, there could be a big difference. Intellectual property attorney, a lot of people calling themselves intellectual property attorneys do not license with the patent office. There is they do trademarks or copyrights and they might say, I'm an intellectual property attorney. You know, it's kind of like like someone who does patents kind of, you know, laughs at it a little bit. Like, you're, you know, you're calling yourself an intellectual property attorney. Like, you don't do real intellectual property. I do real intellectual property. 
It is real intellectual property, but trademarks and copyrights aren't nearly as complex as patents. Um, and on the other side, you can deal with a patent agent who's not an attorney. He's licensed solely to file patent applications. He can file patent applications, but he can't do contracts, and he can't do licenses, and he can't do that sort of thing. And there's even people who call those patent attorneys who might be litigating patents. But when I say patent attorney, when I refer to myself as patent attorney, I file patents. I mean, I work with firms when they go to litigation. I'm litigating now that I'm working with. But what I do with my bread and butter is filing patent applications. I also file trademarks and copyrights as well. Um, okay, other questions? All right, let's take uh, let's take from back there. I haven't got uh, <clears throat> excuse me. A couple slides ago at yeah. the bottom, um, you were discussing um, actually dealing with the examiner. And it's, you said it, at one point the examiner might split the patents in two. That's a restriction requirement. Restriction requirement. Can you go over that a little bit? And, and yeah, what, what are the happens, chances that, that that would happen and how often does it okay, happen? I'll tell you the, the, the theory what's supposed to happen. If I file a patent application that includes, it's for a method of world peace and a method of thermonuclear warfare. Those are two different patents. So, Claims 1 through 10 are on world peace. Claims 11 through 20 are thermonuclear warfare. The inventor thinks they're the same thing. I'll bring world peace through thermonuclear warfare because we'll all be dead no one's fighting. But the, the patent office will say those are two different inventions. So they'll say you have to choose one. So he chooses the thermonuclear warfare because that's a more colored example. And now he chooses to let those, and he can go and file a divisional application, a second application, and he says, the second application is the same disclosure, now examine my claims for, for world peace. So that's basically the way, it works, the way it's supposed to work. What happens practically is you might file something that would be a, um, a, a method of, uh, I don't know why they're all eluding me right now. Okay, the child walking rope thing. Child, the hold on handle. They're holding on a handle. So I, I put device claims for the device of the, of the handle, and I had a, um, a method of using it, a method of having your kids hold on to the handle and walking with it. So the examiner gave me a restriction and said they're different things because I could use this, the, the device as a tie down for my trunk instead of walking with kids. So I got a restriction requirement. So, I mean, that type of thing happens, and then you examine one set of claims, and often what happens is then, after they're done with examination, you say, hey, you know, you've already found all the art for the other one, could you just allow the other one too? And usually, the, the, it might, well, oftentimes they do, and then you get the whole thing. That's basically how restriction requirements work. And it happens, now it can happen whenever you have a device claim and a method claim. You claim a device and a method of use. You may or may not get a restriction. It depends on the examiner, it depends on the art unit, you know, which office you are in the patent office. It depends on a lot of things. So I try and do things to prevent them, but it happens. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you talk about um, the approximate costs that people should expect for each of these things, including legal fees? Uh, trademarks start, I mean, personally, I mean, tra I'm afraid to say this in video because my prices might change when someone's watching the video. Trademarks about $1,000 for filing, including government fee. If you want a full clearance search, another fifteen hundred to two thousand. Uh, patent applications, you know, neighborhood of fifteen hundred for a search, neighborhood of fifty-five to eighty-five hundred for a patent application. You know, depending on complexity. Uh, whole process for a patent. Sorry, is that eighty-five hundred? Yeah. A uh, whole whole process. You know, depending on what happens in the patent office, could be ten to twenty thousand. Whole process for a patent application, spread out over. Know, a couple of years usually at least. Uh, yes? So the 8500 is that one time or multiple times that you're filing as a package? That, <laughs> that would be one utility patent. Okay. And the design patents are including once you get done with drawings and government fees and, uh, and uh, lawyer fees, the design patent might be in the Right now it comes up to usually 1720 altogether, including government fees and stuff for a design patent. But if you're watching this on the video later, <laughs> this video might be out of date. <laughs> so, um, all right. What yes. About I hate that question. The reason I hate that question is it's very open ended. If you want me to take your disclosure, you know, you want me to take your, your for a stereo, and I take your stereo manual, that's everything, and file it, it might be a few hundred bucks plus 125 government fee. Now, if you want me to draft the whole thing like it's the non provisional, I put the whole thing together. You know, it could be the whole thing. So I try and prorate it 
like what percentage of work am I putting into this compared to the whole thing and come up with the price. I mean, I usually do flat, flat prices for patent applications for a certain amount of product and that's time of filing. So, you know, it depends. Yes? <clears throat> Is there anything that uh, someone who's just starting out could do immediately that's very low cost or maybe a do-it-yourself solution for a short term uh, to, to help protect themselves, you know, for when they are ready for the full-blown, whatever it is, protection, you know, some other IP protection. Keep quiet and uh, use confidentiality agreements. And, uh, yeah, I mean, if you don't want to spend the money, I mean, that's, there's the provisional, but, uh, you know, just make sure it's done right. I, I guess well enough, I should say. Maybe a better question is, what mistakes do you see commonly made that we should all avoid? Not spending the money where you should, because in the beginning when you're a startup, you don't have a lot of money. You know, you got to spread it thin, and there's things that often should be protected that aren't. That then you'll find you're not getting the investor dollars, or worse, you're getting people copying you, knocking you off, and you don't have proper protection. After the fact, it's much harder to then file and get people to stop, um, and it takes time to obtain this protection, even if you can, still can. Like trademarks, you, you can. Copyrights, you can, but your damages are less. Uh, trademarks, you can always file later, but trademark damages, once people are copying you, you got to get it to recall. Much easier. But you're in a much better bargaining position. When I write the cease and desist letter to another lawyer, you have a registered trademark, much better arguing position than if you just try to argue and pay this to someone my client's product. <coughs> that type of thing. All right, so. To conclude, typical timeline utility patent. Search, suppose we file this in January, we do search in January, about two months later, I'll be able to draft the filing application by about March, information disclosure about May, foreign filing if you so choose, within one year, you can delay the speed till here, office actions, uh, 15 to 50 months, so let's suppose you get one before 2013, which is being a little generous, and you might get an issued about 2014. And thank you. That's me. That's my number. Business cards are right here. And let me take a few, few more questions. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to look up your trademark and your trademark question. And we're going to see how this works in real life on trademarks. So do you have any other questions before I go to that? Um, yes, sir. For a global application of What do you mean global? Like All 181 global. countries? Uh, I'd just say the dollars. Like seven or eight countries, like the most in Europe, Asia, and in Americas. Japan is particularly expensive. Uh, Europe is also expensive, come to think of it. Canada is reasonable. Canada might cost you uh, 1600 1700 for filing all in my fee, government fee, foreign associate fee. Uh, generally, filing will cost you, in the neighborhood, it's India will cost you about twelve hundred. It's the cheapest. Uh, in generally, the neighborhood of I say twelve hundred to twenty five hundred to file in foreign countries. All in with the fees for filing. Uh, European Union will get you all the European countries. It costs you about four thousand. Uh, and they fall within that range. Like most other countries, UK only is about eighteen hundred. And then it's examination. It depends what happens in their office actions and their search reports and their whatever, how much you go back and forth. But I guess I would tell the company, budget minimum 5000 per country, more for Europe and Japan. Maximum 10, 15, maybe even 20000 per country. Probably pushing it. If your application is getting rejected everywhere, you can spend a ton everywhere. But if you know your application is good, then you're going to prosecute it all the way through in the other countries. So then hopefully it becomes more streamlined process. And, you know, bulk, it becomes a little more cost effective. But, Say at least budget 10,000 per country. Yes? I have a question about like the IC codes for trademarking. Yeah. So if, you know, I'm looking into it and basically some of our competitors or the players in the field are all using one IC code. Okay, like so hold that question players. because I'll go through, I even talk about classes and trademarks, which is talking about ICs or international classes. Okay. And um, when I look up his, we'll talk about the goods and services and the international classes at the same time. Perfect. Okay, yes. Um, in, in case of, let's say, you're looking for investment money, right? Yes. And let's say some investors might not want to sign an NDA. That is very common. Investors usually don't want to sign NDAs, which so, is why you need to file a patent first. 
what if you look? What if you don't have a money to file the patent first because you're trying to make it to the bidding? Got what relatives with provisional. <laughs> it's something. It's something. Yeah, because then you can at least disclose. But uh, yeah, I mean, like, like just what are the boundaries between disclosing something? Um, Having somebody sign NDA doesn't mean this. I would not disclose without an NDA. Without a non-disclosure agreement, I would not disclose something which is patentable, period. But it would be my recommendation. And if you if you do the provisional first, then can you do it without the NDA? You can. I, I, it's not the best idea, but you could. You're at least then, you know, you got something there. And it shows what date you were possession and ownership. And a patent is much better than any NDA. You know, trying to sue for an NDA compared to trying to sue for patent infringement. It's, it's again, it's like trying to prove, once you have something, the same thing that I was saying with trademarks, once you have something registered and recognized by the government, it's there, you can look at it, you can see what's protected, anyone else is infringing. Whereas your contractual relationship with another person, you gotta prove it, you gotta prove your case if it's, a, if it's not already recognized by the government. Whereas once it's registered, the burden is on the other person. The burden is, hey, this is there, they have to prove it not. Then on the same, same amount of time from when you can disclose it to like investors, how much time does it take from, let's say I come to your office today, how, what's like a guesstimate of? To do a provisional? No, like when are we able to file like the patent? Uh, again, about two, two months usually to do a, to do a non-provisional. It's usually the time do. If you need more, I'm sure we can work it out. You know? <laughs> but you said you don't have the money, so I'm not so sure. I know, I'm just, I'm just I know. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> say you invented something, it's a website for example, it goes up live in July, and then you you apply for a patent like three months later. Who, you know, if somebody copies you after you make yeah. it live, and then you file the patent, yeah. who's gonna win out in that case, do you think? It go, well, right now it's still first to inventor system. So if he's the first to invent, he's gonna win. If you're the first to invent, you'll win. And meaning by win, if you have the patent, you can now sue him for damages or an injunction against him doing it. Mm -hmm. Whereas if he's the first, he's able to do it. You might still have your patent, you might not, but he won't be able to sue you for damages because he has no patent. Well, there might be other ways, but generally speaking. Uh, yes? If I know someone else is filing a patent, and I would release the design to the, to the public, general yeah. public, openly, prior to that patent getting through, being approved, yeah. Uh, would that, in a, would the other person be able to stop me from uh, having, sending out this kind of information to the public for free? Uh, well, what you can do, I think the question is really, if there's a pending patent and you infringe, what rights does the, the order of the pending patent have? And in that case, if it's published, uh, he can send a cease and desist letter. He can say, I'm putting you on notice. I expect this patent to issue. What it does issue, I will sue you for willful infringement damages, which are absurdly high, for willful infringing my patent back to the date of publication. So you can request early publication. You can have it published within a few months after filing. It typically is published 18 months after filing, and you basically sue for retroactive damages. If you can put a person on notice, to make it willful infringement, and damages are much higher. All right, let me get to some trademarks. <coughs> Um, so USPTO.gov. Oh, that's interesting. They just changed their website. It's not a good time for them to change it on me when I need to find stuff. Uh, our former home. I'm going to use that for now. <laughs> that's better. That's Search for, yesterday. Like, they must have just changed they, it. I they think they just changed it yesterday. I just got an email yeah. that they just changed it. All right. Okay. Um, <laughs> What was over there? What was uh, in the back of the iPhone? <laughs> what was the mark? What was what you said? I was just fired. asking how Donald Trump said oh, uh, you're, you're fired. fired. You're fired. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to do a quick and dirty search here. As my apprentice, you're never. All right, that's somebody else. Uh, okay. It turns out there's a hell of a lot of monks for you're fired. Most of them are dead, meaning the people didn't pay the renewal fees or they weren't allowed to begin with. So let's look at some of the live marks. Well, this one is kind of different, but here, look at this. This one's actually registered, so it's got a registration number. And let's look at this one. So this one, you're fired for beverage glassware, 
So how do you read this? This is at the trademark office database. So you're fired is a word mark that's the name of the trademark. International class 21. International classes, <coughs> it's a question on it. Trademarks are, are in different classes depending on the goods. So I actually have over here, trademarks, uh, trademark international classes. So these are the classes. So like class one is chemicals. I mean, IC, for example. Class 25 is clothing. So you know, I do a lot in that category. So 21, household and kitchen utensils and containers. So that's what this one is. It's international class 21. So government charges you a different fee for every international class. Um, and sometimes they make sense, sometimes not so much. If you're filing for beverages and glassware, it's international class 21. You're then doing the chemical cleaner called You're Fired. That was a good name to me. It's class one. Uh, so it would be two separate classes. And they're saying they're actually using it since 2004. So that's OK, because your fire is a phrase with secondary meaning. Now I'm creating a new meaning. Your fire now means this type of glassware as opposed to firing somebody. Um, and here's another one. So this is class 41, which is a service mark. Once they get to high numbers, it's some kind of service. Providing studio facilities to paint your own pottery. That's cute. You're fired. For Fire and pottery. So, in terms of Trump, it's a very good question. Obama, you're fired. You're fired, the Donald. Is that it? It's a band. Oh, this is interesting. Order Donald Trump. <laughs> Here it is. Filed 2004, abandoned 2005. He never actually used it, but he was going to have your fire for your class 16 paper goods, 18 home furniture, pillows, housewares, linens, toys, and sporting goods. I think he, he sued somebody over this. And that's, I think it was he had an act of voice on that. That's why I asked that. I, I, I'm not going to defend him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> question about the US classifications then? So, like, if we understand about the IC codes and yes. the different categories. Yes. But it seems that the, um, I was looking into it, the, um, the U.S. codes are very, very antiquated. Who, who assigns those? Do you pick them out, or do they look at it and assign a few of those codes? I, I mean, the answer to both of those is, I guess, could be yes. Um, this is interesting. Okay, I'll answer that question one sec. I'm just looking. The whole trademark files are online. You can look at anyone's trademark. He, he, he actually got refused in class 28, which I have to go back and see what that was. And I can look up these marks and see why he was refused registration. This is a likelihood of confusion because he was too similar to other marks. Prior pending applications. These are all ahead of him, which might be problematic. And then here, here's identification of goods. So this actually goes right to your question perfectly. So the trademark office said, and they are the most pedantic in the world. When I file trademarks coming from other countries, they might file for paper goods in, 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 in Europe. It's, uh, I think the office in Switzerland with a wipe up. And it'll be fine. It comes here, the same mark they've been using for 10 years in, the, in Europe, it gets rejected. So that's not good enough. Paper goods, namely what? You've got to be specific. So generally, what I do is I use their automated system where I pick out from the trademark list uh, of a list of goods and services which are already, it says what, what is already accepted, what classes you can use. Because then I don't get these rejections, and it's much cheaper for the client later. Okay. Because I used to file them on paper, my previous job. Old guy did everything on paper. We had to write all these out. And they would say, that doesn't belong in your trash class 16, that belongs in 18. And your description isn't good. We'd sit there amending it and you know, going back and forth the examiner. The online system is largely done away with it, with people who use it, because I just select the goods. I know the classes it goes in, and I can tell you the time of filing, what they're going to accept and what not. So can you, um, they also have a thing where you can request something be added to the ID manual. Don't bother. Don't bother, it's not gonna work? I mean, that is, it'll work eventually. Okay. <laughs> you know, maybe. They're gonna have to get enough requests and there's gonna probably one person in charge of adding the stuff to the database or worse, a committee, and it may or may not ever get added. But for your purposes, it'll get added in one year, two years, you're gonna, you're gonna have to file well before then. Uh, if there's, I've been able, I've, I can't recall a case where I've ever not been able to fit in with their with the things that you can select okay. because some of them are also open ended. So it might be paper goods, and you're allowed to add in the description. Um, but if you really have that problem, then you can enter it free for it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
You can do that, you and it can still be accepted. Yeah. It can be accepted. Yeah, but it's getting to more specific. All right. Okay. And then there was one other, it was yours, I think. Yeah. Uh, do you want the mark now? Oh, yeah. Let's look up your mark and let's see what went on there. Okay. It was storage by right now. I can't remember if I used the .com or not. Similar marks, but it was merely descriptive. Yeah. Because, as they write here, it describes an ingredient quality characteristic function, feature, purpose, or use of specified goods or services. Because you're describing storing by mail. So you're storing stuff based on the mail. I might have argued this one. I think there's room to argue that it's not really descriptive. I don't really know. You know, is it, is it, is it really clear what services you're doing? But what you could have done is right here. This is what many people miss. Sometimes it's not in the office action, but if, it, if the examiner's writing properly, they put it on. Although it's refused, you may submit evidence in support of registration. If you choose to respond, you may also, oops, I'm sorry, it's not what I thought it was. You can get on the supplemental register. That's not the paragraph I thought. You can uh, respond to it uh, with arguments that it's not descriptive. It's not merely descriptive of your goods. I don't really know what you're doing. Um, and uh, you can also cancel some of your goods. Like if I file applications, there's, there's, different, there's different opinions on this. I generally file them with a short list of goods and services. When we did them on paper, we used to do real long because in case one wasn't accepted, we got others. But a short list is OK, because it's also likely or confusing. Anything that's confusingly similar. So I might just do a short list and leave the ones that are going to get through, which aren't so <coughs> descriptive-like, and say, well, it's not descriptive for this service, and then argue it. Um, but the other thing is, once you're actually using this mark, you can get it on the supplemental register. And on the supplemental register, you don't get the same damages. Use the R with the circle. Once you're using it for five years, you get primary. What are the drawings for trademark? A logo or something? Well, a logo. You might have drawings for the logo. You might have the logo if it's a logo mark. The logo instead of just the words. Do you have to have it? No. Yeah, they're, they're two separate things. I could break the name storage by mail, I could file a separate application for his logo. Um, and then you need to submit a specimen of use. You need to show you're actually using it to get the name. So you submit a sample of whatever it is, storage by mail on his storefront or whatever the case might be. Could it be a website? Like, it depends. It depends what it is. For a service mark, yes. For a word for for a regular trademark, it's gotta be on the product you're actually selling. So if your product is website services, yeah. If your product is canaries, it's got to be okay. a picture of a canary box that has a name on it, you know, whatever it is. Uh, all right, do we have uh, 11 o'clock? So yes. One quick question. If you get a domain name, do you always get a trademark? No, totally different systems. Domain name and trademark are yeah. I'm just saying to protect your domain name is one thing. So. You should. You should do it. Because then when you get that fraudulent letter from the uh, Chinese ISP that pig in China today that says, someone tried to register your, your name .cn and .hk and pay us $500 to register it first, then uh, you'd be like, that's not really a problem. I have the trademark. You know, that type of thing. Um, OK. Um, it's 11 o'clock, so I'm going to stick around a little more to answer questions. Uh, does Yeah, you can cut off the video. and. Um, I guess come up to me if you have more questions, and um, that is all. Thank you for attending, and this was a very good audience.